بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علومك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين Alhamdulillah, we have tawfiq to continue our study of Islamic theory of education. In the previous sessions, we had two sessions. We talked about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge and why so much emphasis is put on his knowledge among other qualities. And then we talked about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being a teacher. Now, inshallah, we want to talk about Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being a teacher according to the Quran. You are all familiar with this beautiful Dua of Ibrahim and Ismail alayhim as salam. Wa idh yarfa'u Ibrahim al qawa'id min al bayt wa Ismail. When they were restoring Kaaba and erecting the walls of Kaaba on the foundations which were from before. They made some beautiful du'as. They asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show them their rights, their manasik. They asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make them Muslims, submissive to him, and also from their progeny to be a nation who would be submissive to Allah. وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتَنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكْ And then they said وَبَعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ I am very much impressed by these du'as of Ibrahim and Ismail and I don't have time to go into different parts of this beautiful du'a in some lectures we have explained I want just to focus on this part, focus on this part. وَبْعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ They were just a father and son, but they asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a nation to come from their progeny who would be submissive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is their ambition. And then they asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send a prophet or more precisely a messenger, not a nabi, a rasul. وَبَعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا Very beautiful. He didn't say وَبَعَثْ إِلَيْهِمْ رَسُولًا Oh Allah send to them a messenger. <laughs> he could have said, Oh Allah, please guide them. Oh Allah, please let them benefit from a prophet. But they said no. وَبَعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا A messenger, so the top level, the highest level is Rasul. And فِيهِمْ, not إِلَيْهِمْ also this Rasul, please raise this Rasul from among themselves. It means one of them becomes Rasul. It's very important. وَبَعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ From themselves. Although فِيهِمْ was enough, but to make sure that even if, for example, someone from outside who lives there, is not meant, they said, raise there from themselves Rasulan. 
And this Rasul, they asked to be doing few things. Yatlu alayhim ayatik. One is to recite to them your verses, your communications. So they could see that revelation would come and that messenger would read those revel reveal the verses and communications to the progeny of Ibrahim and Ismail and of course other people also can benefit but they wanted to be the first circle second teach them the book and wisdom I am sure I cannot say 100% but I am sure that this could not be dua of Ibrahim himself Allah must have put in his mouth this dua because very profound it's this prophet should teach them the book and wisdom teaching the book is so important that comes at the top of the tasks of this messenger of course you appreciate that teaching the book is not to teach how to read the Quran although that is important we don't want to underestimate that but that's much more than that these people were Arabs you know <laughs> uh, at least in the time of the Prophet maybe in the time of Ibrahim uh, still they were not there because Ismail later married to a person from Jorham and then you know it continued but in the time of the Prophet these were Arabs so they didn't need someone to teach them how to read Arabic although they couldn't read but I mean to recite the Ta'alimul Kitab means to make them have knowledge of the Kitab. Please listen very carefully. Knowledge of the Kitab in Quranic terminology. Because Quran uses Arabic language as a vehicle it's very important Quran uses Arabic language and in Ilm Usul Al Fiqh we say that all the rules of language that people use in their life day-to-day -day conversations in their writings a speech etc they are also adopted by the Quran linguistic rules are common but at the same time that this we say this is the same language and the same words Quran has its own standards which is not even found in the hadith even the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which are very eloquent very precise very profound as he himself said I have been given words which are very comprehensive if you read the hadith of the Prophet you find it very very clear very eloquent very profound but uh, still not comparable to the Quran Quran has its own standards when Quran talks about guidance you have to find out what does Quran mean when Quran talks about hikmah what Quran talks about uh, I don't know taqwa when Quran talks about il Quran has its own terminology which is uh, still <coughs> 
loaded on the vehicle of Arabic language, but is much, much more deeper. And this is why we can never be satisfied with our understanding of the Quran. We can never reach the depth of this ocean. So, يُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَاب According to the Quran means to give them knowledge of the Kitab. And knowledge of the Kitab means to have access to the depths of this book. You know the story of Prophet Sulaiman and the queen of Saba. When the queen was on her way to the palace of or court of the Suleiman, he asked who can bring his throne, her throne. One jinn قَالَ إِفْرِيتٌ مِنَ الْجِنْ أَنَا آتِيكَ بِهِ قَبْلَ أَنْ تَقُومَ مِنْ مَكَانِكَ I can bring it for you before you stand up or before this meeting finishes because تَقُومَ مِنْ مَقَامِكَ can be interpreted two ways. Anyway, very quickly, in a matter of few seconds or few minutes, I can bring this. إِفْرِيتٌ مِنَ الْجِنِّ وَقَالَ الَّذِي إِنْدَهُ إِلْمٌ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ But the one who had إِلْمٌ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ Some knowledge of the book said أَنَا آتِيكَ بِهِ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَرْتَدَّ إِلَيْكَ طَرْفُكَ Before your eyes blink, I will bring it. It moves almost immediately, instantly, I will bring it. Why this person was so capable? Because he had some knowledge of the book. You, those of you who know Arabic, you know that Tanwin here means some. Ilmun min al kitab, some knowledge of the book. Not even Ilmul kitab. In the discussion about witness, which is available in the book on Imam and Wilayan and also lessons on Islamic beliefs, I have explained that there must be a witness in every generation, and with the Prophet, there was a witness. And that witness had ilmul kitab. Qul kafa billahi shahidan bayni wa baynakum wa man indahu ilmul kitab. That is Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam. Imams had ilmul kitab. We are not talking about someone who had ilmun min al-kitab and was able to do such extraordinary thing. So, Rasulullah has not come to teach us how to read the Qur'an <laughs> or, you know, how to be, for example, truthful, honest, not to do zone to each other. These are very simple things. This is what we have to learn in primary level. The one who has come to accomplish noble traits of character he would be able to teach you al kitab to make you alim of kitab. Yu'allimuhum al kitab. Of course, maybe mu'allim al kitab do his best and no one get ilmun min al kitab except few. It's possible. But this is not the problem with the teacher. The teacher is very capable. He can make you 
someone who has ilmul kitab as he did with Amirul Mu'minin. Rasulullah taught Amirul Mu'minin the whole book. But some people took some of it. Some people maybe didn't take anything. Imam Sadiq salam said to that famous faqih that I don't want to mention the name who had and has lots of followers ma warathakallahu min kitabihi harfa you have not even been given by Allah a letter of the book he is a faqih he has lots of you know, students and followers, but he has not reached that point that can say, I have been given even one letter of the book. Because this book is not a book just to read. It has a reality which is different. In any case, Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail, they ask Allah to raise among their progeny a submissive nation and also among this submissive nation a messenger from themselves who would recite to them his communications and teaches them who would teach them the book with the meaning that I said Teach them hikmah. What is hikmah? And believe me, today, although our knowledge is very limited and we need to invest a lot on learning and education, but when it comes to hikmah, the situation is much worse. Hikmah is something we very much lack. I'm not saying no one has hikmah, but I'm saying we lack. We don't have adequate for most of us. Hikmah is a great gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially for communities, for leaders. وَمَنْ يُؤْتَ الْحِكْمَةِ فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا Whoever has been given wisdom has been given abundant good. Look at Ibrahim and Ismail. At that time, they could foresee the need for teaching hikmah. And teaching hikmah is not to teach philosophy, is not to teach, I don't know, any discipline. Teaching hikmah, like teaching the kitab, needs transformation of the heart and soul so that Allah would project this knowledge and hikmah into their hearts and this is why in Quran it is said yu'tal hikmah or for ilm atainahu these are things that have come from heaven you make the preparations. You go for conventional methods of learning. But the real knowledge and hikmah come from above. And inshallah we'll talk about this later when we talk about hadith of Unwan al-Basri. So, يُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ If you are interested about hikmah, please refer to the lectures. Uh, we had a series on understanding hikmah wisdom in the Quran and also practical wisdom. They knew that this cannot happen without purification of the soul. A good teacher, a good educator knows that should work with the mind and heart of the students. Not just heart, not just mind, both heart and mind. In three places 
in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually refers to this dua of Ibrahim and Ismail, but not as dua again, as a statement. It means that this dua was accepted and Allah actually has done what they wanted. For example, in Surah Jum'ah, and also two other places. So he actually accepted this dua and raised Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam among the people who were progeny of Ibrahim and Ismail. Of course, the message was to go beyond. But the task of Tilawa is there, Ta'alim al Kitab al Hikmah is there, Tazkiyat al Nafs is there. Everything that they said is there. The only thing is that Tazkiyah comes before Ta'alim al Kitab al Hikmah. In these three places. In Dua of Ibrahim and Ismail, Tazkiyah comes last. In Dua of Ibrahim and Ismail, the order maybe needed some revision. <laughs> so Allah, when He talks, He brings Tazkiyah to Nafs before Ta'lim. And the late Imam Khomeini used to emphasize on this point that Tazkiyah bar Ta'lim muqaddamast. Purification of the soul comes before teaching. And Allah brought it before. Of course, as I said, this ta'alim especially is so, because this ta'alim is different from other ta'alim. Even for other ta'alim, we have to make sure that it comes with taskiyah. But ta'alim ul kitab wal hikman certainly needs taskiyah to nafs. And you know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was very much engaged in tazkiyat nafs and if you are interested you can discuss uh, you can study this in the uh, first essay in self-development about self-purification which is also online in message of Thaqalain. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a teacher Allah is teacher Rasulullah is also a teacher Allah taught Allam al-Quran Rasulullah also Yu'allimuhumul Kitab Of course Al-Kitab is not exactly Al-Quran because Al-Kitab is something that Quran is a representation of that we don't want to go to that discussion but certainly it's related to the Quran Quran is a representation of Al-Kitab elsewhere also we find this concept of Rasulullah being teaching explaining for example Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we sent down this book to you لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ So that you explain it for people what has been sent down to them. He was the first Mu'allam of Qur'an, the first Mufassir of the Qur'an. And also through his action he exemplified the Qur'an. I would like to mention this beautiful uh, a story that you must have heard. Uh, I found it in Sunni sources and in Shia sources. In Sunan Ibn Majah, in Sunan al darimi and also in Bihal al-Anwar. There are a slight differences, uh, but the meaning is the same. I don't know if whether it was different occasions or the same occasion, but variation in the reports but the concept is the same 
For example, in Sunan Ibn Majah, it says, and also Shahid Thani Rahmatullah Alai in Muniyatul Murid quotes this hadith. One day Rasulullah went to Masjid. فَإِذَا هُوَ بِحَلْقَتَيْنِ He saw two circles. إِهْدَاهُمَا يَقْرَعُونَ الْقُرْآنِ وَيَدْعُونَ اللَّهِ One circle, they were engaged with recitation of the Qur'an and praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَالْأُخْرَى يَتَعَلَّمُونَ وَيُعَلِّمُونَ The other circle were learning and teaching. And it shows that they had no issue and this was something that was uh, understandable. Neither those who were reciting Qur'an and praying uh, in the sense of dua Neither they had issue with the other people teaching and learning, nor those had issue with them. So there were two circles doing their own job. فَقَالَ النَّبِي صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَعَلَيْهُ كُلُّنَّ عَلَىٰ خَيْرٍ All are doing good. They are not doing something which is wrong. And they are not doing something which might be right, but not should not be done in masjid. Because you cannot do everything in masjid, even if it is right in itself. For example, selling, buying, trade, business, it's good. Calling your, I don't know, family, friends, is good. Sometimes it can be wajib. But when you are in masjid, you are not supposed to do business. When you are in masjid, you are not supposed you know, to talk to other people outside masjid. Especially in the whole of the prayer. So, there must be something which is in itself right. And also it is something that is proper use of masjid. So, when Rasulullah said, they are both good kullun ala khair they are on the good track good position means they are doing good thing in the good place masjid is a place of reciting quran making dua masjid is also a place for learning and teaching but after that he said haula yaqra'una alquran wa yad'una allah these are making dua, Allah may accept, may not accept. These people are teaching and learning. But I am sent, I am raised as a teacher. I'm raised as a teacher. فَجَلَسَ مَعَهُمْ Rasulullah sat with the people who were learning and teaching. Although one of the jobs of the Prophet is يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِكْ But when he does this job, then his job is not to sit with the people you know, whenever they are reciting the Qur'an, also sit with them. If he is going to join people, he joins the people, in Salatul Jama'ah, he joins the people in learning and teaching. Not that every time they want you know, to read the Quran or make dua, he sits with them. Of course, if there is only one thing, maybe. But when it comes to choose, he chooses where there is learning and teaching. And this, he says, this is my mission. Allah has sent me as a teacher. So you, my dear brothers and sisters, who have the honor of teaching, or inshallah in future you will get that honor if you have not yet 
embarked on this journey, don't underestimate this. It's a great blessing if you are a teacher. Of course, a teacher who can do justice to the job. If you are a teacher who can do justice to the job, this is a great honor and you should be very grateful to Allah that has give you a job that he gave to the Prophet. Not in the same scale, but it's the same job. You are Mu'allim. Yes, there are different degrees, but you have the same job. And may Allah, inshallah, give us this honor that till end of our life we would be engaged in learning and teaching, inshallah. In Bihalul Anwar, it's a slightly different, but the same thing. I don't read the other version from Sunan Tarami. I, Darami, I go to uh, Bihar Anwar because time is very limited. خرج صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم فإذا في المسجد مجلسان رسول الله came out of his home there were two majlis two gatherings in masjid مجلس يتفقهون ومجلس يدعون الله ويسألون one uh, gathering was for people who were trying to learn another was for the people who were praying and asking Allah فَقَالَ كِلَ الْمَجْلِسَيْنِ إِلَىٰ خَيْرِ Both gatherings would end with good results, with good things. أَمَّا هَأُولَاءِ فَيَدْعُونَ اللَّهِ Because one group are calling upon Allah. وَأَمَّا هَأُولَاءِ فَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ The other group are learning. وَيُفَقِّهُونَ الْجَاهِلِ And they are teaching those who don't know. But he said, هَأُولَاءِ أَفْوَالِ These people are better. بِالتَّعَلِيمِ أُرْسَلْتُ in the previous version was بُعِثْتُ مُعَلِّمًا Here it says بِالتَّعَلِيمِ أُرْسَلْتُ Allah sent me to teach. ثُمَّ قَعَدَ مَعَهُمْ He sat with them. So, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not only he was a teacher, but this was actually his main task, or at least one of the main tasks. If we don't say the main task, at least one of the main tasks was Ta'aleem. Then the Quran talks about knowledge. Many things in the Quran about knowledge. I only mention few. So we have talked about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his knowledge, his teaching. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his teaching. Of course, about the knowledge of Rasulullah, his thirst for learning. We have things in the Quran I don't have time to mention. Just something about knowledge in the Quran in general. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in chapter 58, verse 11, يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises those among you who have faith, who have Iman, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ Iman is a very important achievement of any person and something that our felicity, our happiness very much depends on it. Amanu wa amilu salahat are two important conditions for felicity in the hereafter. And in a sense, amilu salahat also goes back to Iman because it's a manifestation of Iman. Iman is very important. But then Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتُ And He raises those who have been given knowledge in ranks. So we have Iman, Allah raises those who have Iman, and then Allah raises those who have been given knowledge. It's interesting that, first of all about knowledge, says Utul Ilm. He doesn't say Alladina Utul Iman. Yarfa'illahu Alladina Amanu. 
But when it comes to knowledge, it's like a gift. Of course, even Iman needs Allah's help, Allah's grace, Allah's you know guidance. But you have to achieve Iman. Iman is a voluntary action. But the real knowledge is what you cannot achieve. You can just work for it. It has to be given to you. It's a light that Allah has to give you. But you can work for it. But then he says darajat. There are degrees that are decided by how much knowledge you have. How much knowledge you have been given. And I have many times said this beautiful idea of Allah Tabatabai Rahmatullah Alai that he says after Iman, please listen carefully. He says after Iman, the degrees are decided according to the knowledge. In other words, Mu'minin are put in different degrees based on how much knowledge they have been given. So knowledge is a key factor in determining our position. Of course, this knowledge is a real knowledge. We will talk about it later. In chapter 39, verse 9, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Are those who know and those who don't know the same? إِنَّمَا يَتَذَكَّرُ أُولُو الْأَلْبَابِ Those who have lub, those who have brain, means those who have intellect, those who are in the possession of intellect, they would remember. This is not something that you need to be taught. You just need to remember. No one can say, I have not yet learned. Is knowledge better or not? No, you just need to remember. And this is why Allah doesn't give the answer. He just asks the question. Are those who know and those who don't know the same? Everyone knows that those who know are better than those who don't know. Ayatollah Mutahari Rahmatullah says that Abu Rayhan Biruni, who was a famous mathematician and, you know, uh, in many fields, he also has a very famous book about his journey to India. When he was close to his death and demise, he was visited by a friend or neighbor who was a faqih, a jurist. And he asked him some faqih question. That faqih was surprised that, you know, he is going to die. Why he is still interested in learning? So somehow expressed his surprise. And then Abu Rayhan said, is it better if I know while I, sorry, I die while I know or to die while I don't know? Yes, I am dying. But do you want to say it's better not to know and die or it's better to know and die? هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Are they the same? Of course, in dunya, as I said, we can understand. But in akhirah, you don't need even to be reminded. In akhirah, when the light of knowledge is there, then people don't need even to be reminded. They would see who is in light, who is in darkness. But true knowledge, not just conceptual knowledge. The next issue from Quran about knowledge, which is something that inshallah we have to discuss maybe again and again, is that although we as human beings possess a thirst for knowledge, we, not only we have curiosity, but we have thirst. Curiosity is not enough have thirst for knowledge. 
we would like to know. But although we have this, we have to regulate it. It's not good to know everything. We shouldn't say everything is worth learning, everything is worth teaching, everything is worth reading, everything is worth listening, watching, because it's some kind of information. It's better to have this information. No. It's not that everything is ilm. Ilm that we are talking about must be beneficial. Look at this beautiful ayah in the Quran. Ayah 101 of Surah Ma'idah, chapter 5, verse 101. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. لا تسألوا عن أشياء إن تبدأ لكم تسؤكم Oh, those who have faith. Don't ask about things that if they are disclosed for you, you would be hurt. They would annoy you. Sometimes there are things that maybe I like to know, but if I know, it would be painful. For example, maybe there are people who have said bad things about me. Either they have done ghiba or tohma. I either they have committed backbiting or they have accused me falsely. In any case, all of us, I think, by nature, we want to know who has talked about us favorably or against us. We like to know, but is it good to know? Maybe if you know, many friendships stop, many relations will be broken. Maybe you will not be able to carry on as normal. It's very important that certain things remain unknown. This is why in Islam, we are not supposed to tell people what others have said against them. This kind of namima, as we call it, is not acceptable in Islam. Yes, maybe there are cases that I know bet is better because I can, you know, find a solution, you know, but more than 90% of the cases better not to know. Therefore, it's better not to know at all. Unless someone knows that there is a danger, you know, and there is a big risk and that person should be known. And maybe even in that case, if it's possible not to mention who said this, uh, there are details that has, have to be discussed in its own place. But I'm saying normally it's better not to know. There are secrets of people we should not know. There are things that Maybe if I know I don't have the capacity. For example, if I knew Isma Azam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if I knew the greatest name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do you think I would use it properly always? Do you think I would be able to carry on my normal life? Sometimes or most of the time no. Because when people have no capacity, if they are given some special power, then it can be a headache for them. It can actually sometimes, you know, deviate them because they are not capable. Like, you know, for example, someone who has yet not learned how to drive and you give him the fastest car that if you just press the accelerator, it jumps. For this person, it's dangerous. Let alone, if this person who is driving how, uh, learning how to drive a car, we put him as a pilot. It's dangerous. So, in any case, we need to regulate our reception of information. Something which is not going to harm us. Even something which is not harmful, 
but useless. Do you take something useless and put it in your fridge? Do you take something useless and put it in your guest room? No. So is your mind and heart, are your mind and heart less important? Why everything we watch, we hear, we read, we have to be very careful. So, even the things which are not harmful but useless, we have to avoid. I want to go one step further. Even the things which are useful but not a priority. For example, knowing another language. If I know tens of languages are very useful. But is this a priority for me? I have to understand learning another language, how important it is for me, and then which language. Not that we say learning a language is useful. Our life is very short. Time is very limited. We have lots of things to do, lots of things to achieve. We have to be very selective. So even among those things which are beneficial, we have to prioritize. We should not read every book, we should not listen every lecture, we should not visit every website, we should not go to every gathering or meeting, we have to be very selective. I always mention this example with my you know, close brothers and sisters, and I feel close to you. It's a personal example. When I went to Manchester to start my PhD. I started my PhD January 97. My topic was ethical relativism. It's a philosophical topic about foundations of ethics. I did a search. This is January 97. Maybe if I do search now, it's even more. But at that time, I found about 13 to 1400 books, articles, dissertations about ethical relativism. I didn't start reading library from one end to the other end. I didn't even go to the section on philosophy. I just focused on my topic. But still, in that library and database of that library, there were for about 1,400 books and articles and dissertations. So one selection already done, but still not enough. I thought, what should I do? If I want to read all of them, it would, could have taken decades. If I wanted to just randomly choose, it's not wise. Maybe then I miss some of the better ones. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped me with this uh, strategy. I said first, I would read entries in encyclopedias of philosophy or moral philosophy and handbooks and reference books on ethics because instead of me who is new to this field I can benefit from knowledge of the people who are the best people in the field the editor of an encyclopedia is in this field very experienced and he makes inquiry and finds who is the best person or few people who are the best for writing this entry. So he chooses them. So I started reading entries in this important major philosophical books because written by the best people in the field 
and it's normally also very comprehensive for a person who wants to familiarize with the field encyclopedia is very good because it gives you the holistic idea and then there are some books in bibliography which are the best books so I started with them then went to those books and from those books read other books and then by maybe reading you know 10 20 books and articles I was sure that I would not find anything new and that's the time now to digest to think to be creative so alhamdulillah by the end of first year I managed to have the whole draft of my thesis but it took time because I had to you know uh, develop it but I had the whole thing in the first version ready by end of the first year we have to be selective nowadays we have explosion of information for those who know how to deal with this information it's amazing age so easy you want hadith you want i don't know anything you can find it alhamdulillah this is a great blessing but if someone doesn't know how to approach can be overwhelmed or just can pick the nearest thing this is not wise therefore you have to be very very selective and you have to have also enough of knowledge and expertise to know how to deal with this information you know sometimes I say to people that if you want to confuse or if you want to make a person not able to function you can do two things one not to give him information if you don't give information to someone he cannot function properly he doesn't know what to do or he may make wrong mis you know decisions but there's another way give him too much information <laughs> instead of depriving him of information which he quickly realize, realizes that you know there is no freedom of information give them too much information <laughs> they feel very happy everything is available but indeed they are confused because knowing too much is also a problem if you really love someone give them selected useful information not everything and not nothing okay inshallah we will have a break and then uh, we will see whether we have questions or we would continue the discussion alhamdulillah rabbil alameen